Uh, welcome everyone to our second global virtual meetup. Jeff and Stefan, uh, most people who are watching now probably know you very well, but for the record and for future viewers, if you can just start by uh, introducing yourself and talking a little bit about what you did before you started uh, this journey with Julia, I think that's a good place to start. Okay, uh, so I'm Jeff Bizanson coming to you from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, so Stefan and I, as many of you know, have been working on Julia for more than 10 years uh, at this point. So that's, you know, that's quite a while. That's really most of my career, but uh, uh, Avik asked us to give a little bit of background. So um, right before that, uh, I worked at this MIT startup called Interactive Supercomputing that did uh, basically a parallel computing product that had MATLAB and Python front ends. Um, as I've been very into programming languages and various kinds of technical numerical computing. Uh, and I used to talk to Viral and Alan there about, uh, you know, various programming language ideas I had. Uh, and that company was acquired eventually. And so that kind of created a transition point where we could do something else. And so I, uh, that was kind of my chance to do this. Uh, and since Alan was at MIT, I was able to, you know, sort of pitch him on the idea and he invited me to apply. Uh, you know, thankfully, he was uh, willing to let me do that, and uh, we've been working on it ever since. Um, I'm Stefan Karpinski. So uh, I didn't originally know Jeff. Uh, I did. I went to grad school with Viral, though, so that's that was the connection. Um, and uh, I think we were we were each concurrently uh, in different places complaining to Viral about how bad numerical computing software was at the time back in 2009. And uh, we both had a sort of hankering to try to make a better programming language in that area. And uh, so he, in, in classic Viral fashion, he put us together, he connected us because that's his superpower. Um, and we've been, we've been working on it ever since. And uh, we actually didn't meet each other for the first uh, year or so that we were working on it together. So, um, you know, I remember Jeff came down to uh, the East Village where I live and uh, we met at a burger joint that I was fond of that sadly is no longer there. And, I think that, uh, that was on New Year's Day, wasn't it? I think it was on New Year's Day, yeah. Because uh, you were you were in town for New Year's. Yeah, I was in town for the holiday, yeah. Um, that yeah. burger place was really good too. Oh, that place was amazing. Um, deep fried burgers. They were like fried in this like shell of, of, of dough. Terrible for you, I'm sure, but man, were they delicious. Um, yeah, I think, I think that actually addresses, um, I don't know, one of the questions is about how much development of Julia is done offline. And of course, you know, 2009 was a long time ago, but a lot of things haven't changed. I think our primary interaction is is online. We don't. We do some calls to discuss stuff. Um, there's a there's a weekly triage call on Thursdays. Um, actually, we don't always do it every week, but we do it every other week, roughly. Um, sort of a, a chance to sit down and go through a bunch of things that need to be decided, and just you know try to get through them with enough people to make decisions as quickly as possible. Um, it it has been described as the worst podcast ever. People could. <laughs> People, people can join if they want to, but uh, a lot of people have joined once and then been like, never again. Um, but sometimes it gets entertaining. But yeah, so let's uh, let's do a question, I guess. Um, yeah, these are, these are good questions. I'm, I'm afraid this is going to take two or three hours, but... Uh... <laughs> um, so the top question, I'll read it, is, uh, and I think Jeff is going to be the one who's going to answer it mostly. Are there plan any plans to support passing Julia callbacks to C libraries that can later be called by the C library from a separate thread? Uh, at the moment, this is not possible since Julia is not thread safe, but it would be very useful for signal processing algorithms. Most of the audio IO low, low level C libraries create a different thread for non blocking read write API. Um, for now, it's only possible to use these libraries with, without with blocking API without callback. Um, well, I like a good specific question, I have to say. Uh, it's really interesting that this is the top one. I'm not sure what that means, but that's uh, that's pretty cool. Good, good meaty question right off the bat. Um, yeah, I think it I think it will be possible. 
I believe all we have to do is expose uh, a C entry point to basically initialize whatever thread it's called from, like a you know JL init current thread or something to set up uh, the thread local state that the runtime needs uh, so that Julia code can run on that thread. I think that might be pretty much all that's needed. Uh, so I, I do think it will be possible. Uh, but if the code is written in Julia, it won't it won't be non-blocking. I mean, it'll have to interact with other Julia threads, right? Yes. So well, well, you have the normal problems of callbacks. I mean, it's it mentions writing callbacks in Julia, which is technically possible. But you know, callbacks are very restrictive. There are all sorts of things you don't want to do from a callback. You don't want it to take very long. You don't want to block. Um, so. And you probably you don't you probably don't want excessive pauses even really either. Uh, although you know we don't have a real time GC anyway, so maybe that's not the concern. But uh, yeah, you'd have to be pretty careful what you did in your Julia code because you you really are in a restricted uh, environment in a callback. So you'd have to be pretty careful anyway. So in sense, some, some sense, what people actually want, it seems to me, might be the ability to write Julia code in such a way that they're guaranteed that it's not going to do any any of those dangerous things. It's not going to allocate, It's which, you know, <laughs> the tricky part about that is that's an ever-changing, you know, who knows what the compiler is going to do. It might suddenly decide, I don't feel like optimizing your thing anymore. In a yeah, no, I, I think people do want that, but uh, yeah. but it's, it's, it's a secondary concern, though. I mean, right now, the first thing is just to make it possible, of course. And then if it's too slow or something, that's a that's a different issue. Right. Okay. Uh, next question: What are the three biggest worries about development of the Julia language? Um, that's a good question. Well, I'm not a big worrier. You know, it's not very productive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how much time can you devote to worrying? Really, is it make a calendar item? 10 yeah, to 10:30 I mean, worry. I, I don't I don't I don't know what uh, you know it's it's hard to think of things that I'm existentially worried about uh, about Julia. The language seems to have made it. Um, we I don't think it's going anywhere. I feel like we could you know make some horrible decisions and completely screw it up, but I feel like we're probably not going to do that. Um, well, okay, I can tell you some things that worry me. So uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> one one thing that that keeps me up at night is people encountering problems that they that we don't find out about. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's so sometimes I see people basically reporting bugs on the Gripes channel in Slack, and sometimes I catch those, and sometimes other people catch them, and they get moved to GitHub issues, which is great. But I you know I never know if maybe the right person's not watching the channel, and that doesn't happen, and that and then it scrolls off, and you know, and we yeah. we don't know about it. So that yeah, definitely if, I a, if I had a nickel for every time I've replied to a gripe with file an issue, yeah, I'd, I'd have like maybe you know seven or eight dollars. And I so when I know like I I don't report issues on all the open source software I use, for example. I mean maybe I should, but you know I don't. Of course I don't do that um, all the time. So I I know that there must be people out there who are encountering problems and aren't reporting them for whatever reason. I mean we can't really expect them to. Uh, but that does worry me that there are problems people are encountering that we don't know about because then, of course, I can't fix it if I don't know about it. So that worries me. Um, and speaking to some of the other questions on here, the other thing that worries me is that LVM is going to keep getting slower and slower <laughs> and that it's a very hard current to swim against. Yeah, past, uh, past performance, if it's an indicator, it means LVM is going to get exponentially slower. But every time Valentin puts up the, you know, upgrade to the newest version of LLVM, that's immediately the, the drop of sweat comes out. Oh my God, how much slower is it this time? Yeah, remember when LLVM was like twice as fast as GCC? Those were the days. Yeah. Um, LLVM 3.3 was performed quite well. Yeah, well, and also we, we were on LLVM 3.3 for like yeah. five years. Yeah. So it was a thirdly long time. Um, all right. Uh, what about things we're excited about? Um, it's it's an interesting question because right now I feel like we're very much. There was a period of great excitement, but also great stress leading up to 1.0, and 
because we were making, you know, breaking changes and fixing things and introducing a lot of new stuff. Um, and I feel like lately we're very much in a don't break things for people and try to just like improve incrementally. So I think it's it's one of the it's a healthy period, but it's uh, it's also less exciting in some sense. Um, so until we decide to do Julia 2.0, um, there will be a little bit less excitement. But I, I, that said, I think there's been really great stuff coming out. I mean, um, the work on the debugger that has been amazing, the consistent improvement in compile times over Julia releases has been great. Um, I don't know. What are you excited about, Jeff? Uh, well, we do. Uh, we we are st working a lot on the the infamous latency and time to first plot issue, uh, and we are we're not done with that. So there, there's been a lot of uh, kind of behind the scenes work that's just uh, building up, and and it's, it has not all come to fruition yet. So there are still things in the pipeline. There, uh, we're not out of ideas. Uh, so I do expect to see, you know, uh, some significant further improvements in that direction, uh, mm -hmm. and that will I really think help the language a lot. Um, so I'm excited to see more of that uh, happen. Um, I'm also uh, I'm also excited about uh, the the thread stuff. So the the I, at this point we have the basic sort of thread infrastructure that we want, but it's it needs a lot of extra tuning and work. So we we need to hugely reduce the scheduling overhead that we have. We haven't really had time to yet to dig into that in a big way, but I want to optimize the heck out of that, uh, and I think it'll make threads much more usable. Uh, and that that'll also be really nice to see. Um, I, I'm excited about having the lock option on on file handles. Oh well, you you, you got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. I saw you implemented it, but I'm I'm excited to be able to rely on that because I've I've banged my head against that problem somewhat recently um, with uh, reading generating. Uh, binary diffs of things and uh, I was trying to get that to be as fast as I, I could get it and you know right just writing to the like you know computing the diff I got that really fast and then I hit the IO part and I'm like wait what why is the IO taking so long and then I realized it was locked so I had to jump through some hoops to get around that but it'll be nice to just not have to jump through those hoops. Oh yeah I thought of something else so uh, so currently Chris Foster is working on uh, picking up the work on incorporating the uh, some kind of Julia parser implemented in Julia, something like CST parser, uh, and moving towards using that as the default parser. Uh, so having our standard parser uh, written in Julia and giving hopefully much better error messages and diagnostics uh, and will, will also be, I think, a big bump up uh, of improvement. Uh, and that that will be really nice. And then also, if I if I and the more I think about it, I would also really like to rewrite the rest of the front end as well in Julia, um, for many many reasons. It's a it's a really complicated piece of code, uh, and it's also pretty slow. Uh, so rewriting that in Julia uh, from the interpreted scheme uh, should really help a lot. And so having having the whole front end written in Julia, I think, would be really nice. And it's it's something that's totally possible to do. So I. I I, maybe that can happen within two years, but I, I would be excited to see that. I was going to ask. Uh, I feel like you're you're uh, you were not so excited about that prospect a few years back. Is that just a matter of like the time wasn't right, and it seems like it was always a good idea? You just didn't feel like it was a priority back then, or has it has your perspective shifted? I think it, it's kind of both. So yeah, so a couple years ago, it definitely wasn't the priority. Uh, but now that we're in this more stable period and we're not sort of rushing to change all the things, uh, the idea of just sort of rewriting code starts to make a little more sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's that's part of it. And the other part of it is I've just, uh, you know, just increasingly noticed when looking at, say, the time it takes to pre-compile packages. And now that the amount of code in the whole Julia ecosystem is growing a lot, we're actually spending a lot of time there. Mm -hmm. um, so now, now, you know, if you, uh, people will routinely load big packages that have dozens and dozens of dependencies, and there's many, many thousands of lines of code, probably ten, tens of thousands of lines of code or more, and that the that front end is actually starting to be a noticeable uh, source of the latency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, a thing I'm excited about that's ongoing but not complete is uh, the binary builder stuff. Um, so Elliot and Mose and a bunch of other people in Ian Butterworth was working on stuff there. Um, I know that I know I'm missing some people, but I mean, there's just been a huge amount of work. Uh, Veral has actually been hacking at uh, a lot of binary builder recipes. He's gotten really good at it. And actually that's, that's one of those things people may not realize about him. One of his like great talents in life is that he is amazing at building like obscure numerical software and getting it to work. Um, one of one of the early things that I feel like was a compelling about Julia was that we had just wrapped up a bunch of like really nasty to build Julia like soft numerical software in an easy to use package and like gotten it to just install when you typed make. Um, but that stuff is pretty amazing because it means you can just download tarballs and have working binaries and that yep. is just incredible. Yeah, you know, that, that reminds me, when we first started working on Julia, Veral started diving right into doing all this stuff. And, mm -hmm. I, and, he, and, and I said, oh, wow, I didn't know, you know, you knew all this stuff. And he said, yes, actually, I used to be a, a packager for Debian. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he used to do all that. And I, and I, and I said, well, I, you know, and I, and I had worked with him at Interactive Supercomputing, and I had no idea that he knew anything about that sort of thing. And I was like, well, I, I've been, we've been working at ISC, I, and I had no idea you, you know, you knew about that stuff. And he said, oh, yeah, I made, I made very sure never to mention it, so I wouldn't have to work on build systems. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, little, little known fact about Elliot, right? Like, not only is he a, uh, you know, build system expert extraordinaire and great at building CI systems and whatever, but actually his real expertise is in machine learning. Who knew? Like, uh, you forget these things about people. Yeah. Um, yeah, so another thing I'm excited about is uh, is the package manager getting to the point where uh, I don't have to work on it so much anymore. But <laughs> that's um, well, the, the big thing there. The, the real the real goal of a lot of this work is uh, it, part of it is decoupling us from GitHub a bit because we've had some in incidents recently, and I saw a question about you know when they deleted the Julia images org a lot of things broke, people couldn't install packages, couldn't, people couldn't install instantiate their manifests. And, you know, we should not be at the mercy of, you know, any company. GitHub is a, has been a very good uh, platform for us and, you know, we're really grateful for it, but we should be independent from GitHub or anyone else. Um, so anyone who set a package server up at that point um, actually was able to install packages and that's part of the point of that work. Um, but another point of it is that, you know, uh, someone was, I, I was talking about how the work I'm doing right now, a lot of it is about getting people package updates and package changes and registry changes faster, which, you know, some, someone was like, oh, but it's already really fast. And the, the thing is, it is really fast if you happen to be like in the US uh, with a pretty good connection. But, you know, if you're somewhere far away, if you're in like Australia or China, or if you are on a like bad connection. Um, I mean, just doing a registry update right now is like 1.5 megabytes of compressed data, which could take a really long time to install. So we want that to be a great experience for everybody, not just, you know, people who are close to the server. Um, so I'm excited about that once we get there. Um, I think that will probably alleviate suffering for a lot of people who are like silently, you know, sitting there being like, all right, great. I can go away for half an hour while I update my packages. Um, so one follow-up uh, is uh, what are you guys the most surprised about in the last decade or so? What, you know, when you started mm -hmm. uh, to today, what's been the, what's the thing you would love to tell your 10 year old person? Or a ten year ago person. I mean, the biggest surprise is that this has been successful at all. Like, you know, when we started this, I couldn't have possibly have imagined like that we would be, you know, that this project would have taken off and people would be using it. That's just astonishing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am surprised at just how many people using it and how much stuff they're doing. Like, I, I suspect, for example, at this point, Chris Rakakis has probably written more Julia code than I have. <laughs> for example. I think that's probably true, right? Yeah, that seems yeah. very likely. I think that's probably true. You know, yeah. so that that's that's pretty surprising. You know, just how how the, the sheer quantity of stuff uh, people have done. Mm -hmm. So much code that the front end is not scaling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So the um, next question, very highly upvoted, is of course uh, not a question, but thanks to you, uh, the two of you, and uh, the four of you, indeed. But also, I suppose thanks are due to everybody in the community who's, you know, uh, as you said, contributed to making Julia such. Yeah, no, thank you. And also, yeah, I definitely want to thank all the people who are maintaining packages and, and all of that. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of ongoing work. We have to keep all these thousand packages working and moving. Is yeah. that's a, yeah, thanks to everyone who's doing that. Yep. All right. So this is, uh, the next question is, what is the heading in the subject of inheritance traits interfaces? Um, I, I've personally put this on the back burner, um, not because I don't think it's important, but because I think that currently we're getting by with the, the, the you know, Tim Holy traits trick. Um, and I think it requires a lot of design to get it right. And I just, we've been trying to sort of make the system we have work better first. Um, how do you feel about it, Jeff? Yeah, this it's a really interesting design problem. So, I mean, people have put out some various prototypes and ideas already. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff to think about uh, already in that area. Many people have speculated that this could be a good focus for like a Julia 2.0, yeah. uh, where we have a chance to kind of fundamentally change how the language works. So it's a very interesting thing to think about. Um, I am concerned that it would make the language more complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, it's once you sort of know a language, it's very easy to think, oh, well, I, I could add this feature and it would be cool if it had this feature because you're sort of incrementally learning those things, you know, as you go. But then someone, uh, you know, someone who comes up who's new to it, it's, you're just dumping an awful lot of features in their lap at once at that point. Yeah. Uh, so I'm worried that it's, it's going, it, it might not pay for itself in terms of complexity. And that even though there are cases where it would be useful and nice to have, you're almost better off just saying, no, there's just, there's just less stuff there. Just, you know, make do with that. There's fewer things to have to understand, but I think we'll see, we'll, we'll see. The thing, the thing that um, I would like to see, and it's not necessarily, the answer is not necessarily a language feature, um, but I feel like there's a lot of, variation and lack of structure in terms of how traits are implemented right because it's this thing that's like the trick is cobbled together out of just existing language features there's a lot of um there's a lot of wiggle room in how you write it you know like there's a, there's some function that computes the trait and then the question is does the is the thing that's returned a, a an instance of a type is it a type is it uh you know, a Boolean, something else, and then we do some sort of dispatch and or specialization on that. And I just feel like there's a lot of, because there's so many options there, choices, people do it differently. And therefore, you know, even just silly little things like, you know, how do we capitalize and name the traits? Um, a lot of that stuff just hasn't been regularized. So a, a language feature has the opportunity to give more structure to that. Um, but then, yeah, like you said, it, it makes the makes the language more complex. Yeah, and, and also, you know, traits have a very kind of a static type system, sort of a feel to them. Uh, mm -hmm. In that, you end up having kind of a a sort of parallel set of logic that's kind of running outside of the normal uh, mainstream runtime of the program. Uh, that's it's sort of like you get to you increasingly have this feeling that there's like a compile time sort of component. Uh, in the trait running in the trait logic, uh, and I think it's also you know a, a type system like ours sort of sort of based on partial information uh, about things, and I think it's trait and traits tend to be kind of a very discrete and definite like a logic kind of thing, and it's a little bit harder to have a, sort of infer partial information from them. So it's a little bit it could be a little bit of an awkward fit uh, with with the type system, but not to say that it's impossible. But these are just sort of how I feel about it. Yeah. I think that the thing, the thing that they give that's really powerful is, is obviously that it's like you can do a little bit of computation to figure out <clears throat> sort of not, it's not really a super type, but it's something that behaves like a super type and gets used like a super type. Yeah. Um, and that's a thing that's really hard to express in a type system normally. Like you can't, 
easily express the fact that like, oh, if I have a this, if I have a wrapper around this type of abstract thing, then it should be behave like another instance of that abstract thing, right? That sort of thing can't very easily be put through the, the normal type system, but it tend, turns out to be really useful, especially in like linear algebra um, and sort of building these ge generic wrapper systems. Um, so if we do add something, that's, ki that's the kind of feature that I think it really needs to address. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I've really just, I think that the bottom line is we've been putting it off because it feels like a Julia 2.0 kind of thing. And there's so much other stuff to, to, to work on in the meantime. Uh, your thoughts on loop vectorization.jl. Jeff, you have any thoughts on that? Oh, well, that is an amazing piece of work. Yeah, that, it is. That yeah. package is absolutely incredible. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah, first of all, wow. Um, that is, uh, that, that, that package is basically hitting a massive ball into our court because in theory, maybe that is all stuff that we should have implemented in the compiler at some point, but we have so far failed to, uh, but he did it. And so the question is, okay, how are we, how, what are we gonna do with this? Uh, clearly this is really powerful and useful to getting performance in Julia. So it's, yeah, so it's, it's a big uh, topic for us to, you know, figure out how to respond to it. Do we put it into Julia main compiler? Do we, well, because that's, you know, put, because potentially that makes sense because uh, it's, it's, it's too good to ignore. So it's a big, big question for the language. How, what do we do with it? Yeah, I, I think one of the one of the cool things about it is that it demonstrates that one of the things I love about Julia, which is that it gives the user enough power to do things like that. Like if the compiler is falling down, you can potentially write a macro that like does something clever like loop vectorization and and generates amazingly fast code for you even though the compiler doesn't do it um but yeah it's it's there has been a history of these things that someone implements as a package usually using macros sometimes using generated functions but you know one of these like really powerful features that is sort of equivalent to like hooking into the compiler somehow and then yeah, then then the ball is in our court. It's like, okay, well, uh, you shouldn't have to do that. We should offer that for you. So now, how do we go about doing that? Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely it definitely ups the ante on vectorization. Uh, so the next question is, what do you think is needed from a technical point of view to make Julia the go-to language for differential programming? Well, I think it's already pretty good. Uh, it does seem to be the system, the two systems where differential programming really works seems to be PyTorch and Julia. Um, and I think the Julia approach as it classically has been is more, you know, try to do it right. Uh, even if that takes a long time and a lot of effort, um, and eventually, you know, do it do it the right way. Uh, I think the downside of that is that we've been working on doing it the right way for a long time, and it, they're just keep being compiler tech roadblocks to that. Um, yeah, actually, just this week, I've I've been playing with uh, Avik Paul's uh, differentiable ray tracer, which is it's really cool. It's mm -hmm. it's it's fun to play with. It works. Uh, you can differentiate a ray tracer. How cool is that? That is amazing. It's pretty cool. Uh, so it 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 kind of kind of works. Am I and also? I mean, you really have to ask uh, Mike Innes uh, and maybe maybe Keno uh, to tell you what's missing on the uh, auto diff stuff. Um, they they could tell you more. But my my understanding is that um, so basically for like first order stuff, it it's it's pretty much there. Um, but I my understanding is for higher order derivatives, uh, the code kind of explodes and it's uh, the compile time gets really, really slow. And we need to do some things differently in the way the compiler works to be able to support that. And they have a design for it, they have a plan, but we haven't done that yet. So I think that's the, the missing thing is the higher order derivatives. That's, that's my understanding. Um, I, I would also uh, 
I wanted to say that I know Chris Rakakis has a sort of vision for how this AD stuff should work that's a little bit different than so the 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 approach that Julia has been taking has been uh sort of the like the hard line approach is like just make it so that the compiler can a auto diff everything um but there's a different approach which Chris has like written written about a bit and uh, Lyndon uh, created the chain rules package I think um and that approach is a little bit different. The idea is that instead of just insisting that the compiler figure out derivatives all the time, allow make it more possible for people to plug in known derivatives for various things in a way that's composable and reusable and only rely on the AD, the fully automatic AD in cases where we don't have that. So it's sort of, it combines knowing the, you know, hand known derivatives um, that are encoded in chain rules with AD tech to sort of glue it all together and figure out the rest. Um, and that type of hybrid approach does seem promising to me. That seems like an approach that would, it seems pragmatic. I, I feel like there's going to be places where you really want to plug in the known derivative instead of making the compiler figure it out. Yeah, I think Zygo does that a bit. There are there are a bunch of uh, custom yeah. derivatives implemented in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would also point out we're actually not exactly the right people to ask about AD. Like we know about it, but sort of we're we're uh, well informed amateurs in the field. At, at yes. That. So. Very much. Yeah. Ask uh, Ask Mike Innes. Yeah. Um. All right, next question. Uh, package compiler is great, but there are several deployment use cases it doesn't cover due to binary size. Do you see a future in which a user can make some trade-offs in code gen to emit smaller binaries of Julia programs like Go? Yeah, we talk about this a lot. This is this is a common request. So we're, we're gonna do something eventually for sure. How feasible do you think it is? Because I mean, Go is, you know, a statically compiled language. They, it's not got a lot of dynamism to it. Um, you know, they don't even they don't even have you know a lot of forms of dispatch. There there's, are various forms of dispatch, but it's a lot more static than Julia. And you know, to what extent do you think it'll even be feasible to figure out like, oh, we can get rid of all of this code because it's never going to be called because. I mean, can you really figure that out? Like, what's Yeah, so we need there? to add, I think, basically a no eval uh, compiler switch. So it, you, you tell it that it's allowed to assume no one's going to call eval. Because if you can call eval, then you can, uh, you can access absolutely anything that the system has ever seen. Uh, and you can load new code. Uh, so you can't do any kind of tree shaking because it, it's, it is impossible to predict what someone might call. Uh, but if you if you pass the the no eval flag, then we can go through and and do and do tree shaking and and delete the stuff that doesn't seem to be reachable uh, from the code that's there. Um, well, what about? So I guess my my worry, and I don't know how how founded this is, but my worry is that even knowing that someone isn't going to call eval might often not be enough. I mean isn't dynamic dispatch sometimes and it, you know bad enough that you're like well i don't this could call like these 20 different methods and <clears throat> who knows so therefore we have to assume that all of them get called and therefore there's a huge amount of code we need to keep around yeah yeah you'd have you'd have to include basically all methods but hopefully you could you could remove entire functions that are never referenced but in general you'd have to for sure keep every method of functions that are used yes when I guess Julia is very good about you no, know, we know we know how to statically resolve what object something refers to in terms of function names and stuff like that. Methods are the only part that's dynamic. Um, but I, I guess, um, do you think spending more time in the compiler, uh, like the compiler could do, for example, I know we we only do forward data flow analysis in in the in type inference. Do you think something like you know reverse data flow? analysis could help figure out like, oh, well, we know we can't call these methods because we spent even more time compiling this to figure that out. Uh, maybe a little bit, but I, it's hard to guess. It's a, it's a good question. Yeah. Would turning on reverse data flow let you cut more uh, methods out and prune more edges? It's a, it's a good question. I'm not sure. 
Or, I mean, you could go like full, you know, you could have some sort of like logic programming system that, you know, get gets to go hog wild and try to prove whatever it can about, uh, <clears throat> about the call graph. I, I feel like that's probably diminishing returns at that point, but you never know. Yeah, yeah, I, I think there's there's probably low hanging fruit just in terms of cutting out, you know, big, big chunks of things that aren't used. Yeah. But we the other thing is, you know, we tend to have pretty big libraries, like if you even use a couple things in linear algebra, for instance, you know, that's probably going to bring in quite a bit of code. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, which most of which you can drop because, you know, you're not, you're only calling three of the uh, 50 BLAS calls that we we uh, actually expose to the user. Although then slicing up the BLOS library is actually a slightly different issue, but um, still possible, I guess. Um, all right, so next question. Currently the Julia ecosystem is largely focused on scientific technical computing. How much do you think the Julia community should keep this focus or should the community exp significantly expand out to the wider world? There's already been some existing projects like Genie for web dev, and I personally would love to see Julia being used in all kinds of areas since it has such great potential. Um, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think, um, you know, pre 1.0, I think it was very important to keep focus on numerical computing because, you know, you want to do the thing that you set out to do as well as you can. In a lot, a lot of ways, we've talked about how numerical computing is strictly harder than general computing. Um, there's like special challenges in numerical computing that you just don't get if, you know, all you're doing is writing a, you know, a highly concurrent web server, like that's hard. It's hard to get right, but you know, you tend to only deal with like a certain fairly limited set of data types. Um, what do you think, Jeff? Yeah, no, I, I definitely want to see, uh, see expanding to other areas, but, uh, you know, I think all we can do is kind of, if you build it, they will come, you know, and, and think about what is, uh, what's maybe keeping people away. And the last question might be an example of that, actually. I think, you know, pro programmers who are used to uh, the kind of, just used to the way that a language like Go or, or Rust works, uh, when they see that we can't generate a small executable, that kind of sends a message. It sort of signals to them that, oh, this isn't the kind of thing you use, mm -hmm. you know, and so they kind of don't use it. Um, but if we could do that, I think that that could change. Yeah. So that that's probably something we might need to, to do to uh, attract different kinds of programmers. Yeah. I mean, I, I am very jealous of the the high quality of the all of the like network protocol implementations in Go, right? But that's not oh, yeah. an yeah. that's not an inherent feature of the Go programming language. Go is good at that, and it's designed such that it can be good at that. But that's really a feature of the fact that people are using it to write network services at Google and a huge amount of manpower and expertise has gone into like writing, you know, incredible implementations of these network protocols and making sure they're like really smooth and exactly implement the spec. Yeah. Um, so I would love to see more of that. A lot of that is just a matter of like e effort going through and just doing a really good solid implementation of each of these things. Um, fortunately, you know, the, the number of protocols that people use is not, uh, ever expanding. It's actually been consolidating towards a smaller number in general. Like H if you, if you have a great implementation of HTTP, that gets you like 80% of the way there. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, next time to first plot. <laughs> Yes, I'm glad. I'm glad people are asking about that. Yeah, there there will be more improvement. Uh, so there is it. it we cut off about 20, 25 percent. I think we can expect to see it maybe get cut in half again. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is it at now? Um, well, it depends. You, you, you actually time on your laptop the time to first plot. Like I do. So it depends exactly what you time, and it depends on what your machine is. So I I have a pretty old laptop actually. So that's uh, I I can't. I'm not going to let myself get a newer, faster laptop until I until we make make some more progress on this latency thing. So to make sure I feel the pain, that's definitely a a policy of mine. Um. Yeah, and Kevin uh, has like an eight-year-old laptop, which he was 
talking about and it's like oh my god just buy a new laptop so i, I think it used to be uh, about it used to be about 20 seconds for me and now it's 14. okay that's good that's and i think we from from doing some kind of experiments and hacking things together i think we i have visibility down to getting it to, to seven or eight mm. on my six-year-old laptop that's pretty good i mean that's that's uh so I, I feel like there's two things I feel about that. One is that it is a huge improvement and it gets it within the realm of like waiting seven seconds for something interactive. You're like, okay, that's like slightly annoying, but not bad. Um, whereas like, you know, it started out at like 30 seconds in 1.0 or worse in which, yeah. at which point you're like, okay, no, this is just totally intolerable. So well, the, the other... The other thing we're going to do is is uh, work on some tooling to make it easier to build system images. So absolutely everything is fully pre-compiled, uh, and and then there'll be just no delay. Then it takes no time. So that's the only way to get it down to zero is to do that. So I, we'll also uh, be working on system image tooling to make that much easier to use. Yeah, I guess there's two pieces of the system image tooling. There's the ability to generate system images. Um, we can already do that. I can, I think I'm I'm unclear on whether we can incrementally update a system image. I feel like Jameson tells me that we can. I think I think we can. Yes. Yeah, okay. you can. Okay, so that's good. So we can incrementally update a system image. Um, just to clarify for people, that's different than separate compilation. Separate compilation is where you know you compile a package by itself, and then you can just stitch packages together. Um, we can't do that because we specialized code too much um, and the interaction between packages is too too high it generates you know custom code um, but we can what we can do is you know you've loaded some stuff and you save a system image and then you re you know resume that system image and then you load more stuff and you'd like to save a new system image including all the stuff you had previously had and that's what we can do um, so the, technically, I think it's all there, right? Like we can do all the things we need to do. What we really need yeah. to work on is figure out is the workflow. Exactly. Like how do you take that ability and make it expose it to the user in such a way that it's really easy to use and they don't have to think about it? Yeah, exactly. And that's really hard. Um, we have we've had discussions about it. I mean, that we have a weekly compiler call. Um, that's a, an in, internal Julia computing call because it's for the compiler team at Julia, at Julia computing. But, uh, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're worried a lot about this is, this has been a hot topic for the last several months. Not that I'm working on it, but I'm on the call all the time and asking about it. And I know there, there's always this trade-off where we're, we're, you know, it's easier to do things that are later in the pipeline. So if you're willing to wait until, to like generate the system image really late, like when you call plot, then we can totally do it and it'll be relatively efficient. But that's like the most annoying time to have to wait to generate a system image. Whereas the best time would be like when I install these packages, I, then I'm willing to wait because I was you know downloading some stuff anyway. Um, the trouble is that at the point where we're installing packages, we don't know if you're done yet um, we don't know what other things you're going to install and you don't want to like, you don't want to compile a new system image every time someone installs or upgrades a package because then you're wasting a lot of time. Um, so it's unclear yeah. what the right, you know, so it's so, sort of on the one hand you have like, we know, we know what you, we should actually be compiling, but it's super annoying that it happens at that point in time versus on the other hand, you know, it's, early and not annoying it, you know, when you install things, but then we might have to do the work over again. Um, so we haven't really figured that out yet, but it's actually, it's a really a workflow issue at this point, not a technology issue. Yeah. So fortunately the next question is also about the time to first plot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so don't solutions like lowering the optimization level in plots mean that you're giving up on further improving latency? So no. Um, so first of all, this is this is a problem that requires a multi-prong attack. This it, multiple things need to be done uh, to to really to fix this. It's not just one thing, uh, and so this is one of the things, right? So the best way to optimize some work that's taking a long time is to not do it if you don't need to, right? And you know, there's the 80-20 rule: 80% 80 of the time is in 20% of the code. So you shouldn't need to spend time optimizing the code that's not performance critical. 
Uh, so being able to do that and not spend a lot of time trying to optimize code that doesn't need it is is part of the solution. It's not the full solution, but it's absolutely part of it. So it's it's not giving up. It's a it's a key piece of it. All right. So I have a, a question about that though. Um, what are there cases and how? I mean, what do you think about cases where? there's code that in some contexts does not need to be optimized because we don't care about the performance of it. But then in other contexts, that same code is used in a performance critical way. So we can't just say, oh, don't ever optimize this. Do you feel like that's an issue? And if so, like, what could we do about it? Yeah, so the, this flag is not very widely applicable. I mean, plots is sort of the banner use case for it because as, as far as I can tell from what I've measured, there's basically never any case in plots where that code needs to be fast. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess what you're talking about is so someone, uh, you know, where the performance depends on like the caller of the library, like you have some routine that you might not care about the performance of, but someone else calls it in an inner loop, right? Mm -hmm. So that, well, I, I would like to think that the, you know, the person writing that function would probably not mark it as, you know, low optimization level because if it's something that's potentially used that way. Like you're you're probably not going to make a loop that makes a billion plots. Yeah, that's true. Probably not. But for, mo for most code, you, you don't know. So yeah, it's not very widely applicable. You can't just put this on, you know, every random package, obviously, because yeah, you don't know if someone might depend on the performance of it. So it's, well, it's at, not super- At that point, you might as well yeah. just start Julia with the dash O one flag. But it's for, it's, but it's it, what it's, I mean, it's really great for stuff like the REPL and the package manager and plots where the, these are big pieces of code, like the, you know, the package manager has a lot of code, for example, uh, and it's not performance critical. We know it's not performance critical. Right. So that's, that's the use case for it. Anything else where you're not sure it's then, then yeah, don't, you can't really use it. You can't use this. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's just one of the pieces and I guess the answer is, you know, if, so, if some code might be used in a performance critical way, then don't, don't mark it as not performance critical. Um, only only do it for code that re it really does not matter. Um, the package manager is a great example. Uh, all right, next question. Uh, with Google and Apple behind Swift and even Facebook hiring to contribute to the compiler, what's the outlook for Julia getting big corporate backing? Uh, I, I don't know. Does yeah, well, computing count as big corporate backing? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, anyway. No. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, um, if some big corporation wants to buy us for like $100 million and we can get to keep working on Julia, I'd be down with that. But uh, no, there's, there's no immediate uh, impending prospect. Uh, but uh, who knows? Could happen. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, for now, this is something I'm pretty proud of, right? Like every other programming language that's has significant use has one of the really big companies like a Google or a Microsoft invested in it. I think that's pretty much tends to be true. Uh, true. But, but Julia is a rare case where I think you have a very, uh, very useful and, you know, pretty reasonably widely used language that does not have one of the, you know, one of the tech giants. Uh, behind it. So, and I, I'm, I'm kind of proud of that, that we, we've managed to, uh, everyone in the Julia community has managed to make something so good over the whole ecosystem without that ever happening. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, that is, that is pretty cool. Let's see if we could go back in time to commit, uh, uh, yes, commit a nine CBC 036 AC. <laughs> Is that the empty one? How I remember the, yes. Um, <laughs> what would we do differently? Um, the empty commit was too empty. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, I mean, there was that time that Veral checked in a bunch of 404 HTML pages. I would probably undo that. Uh, yes, let's undo that. Yeah. Uh, I, going back in time, it was kind of funny to see, I, I had forgotten about this, but um, Someone, there's this tool, I forget what it is, where you can sort of see the amount of code and some like in different directories over time. And there's, a, you can generate a video of it. Um, and I think like a plot over time. And there is this huge spike back in like, um, know, when was it, I guess? It was like pre 0.1 days. 
and I, I had forgotten about this, but we were basically just, we didn't have a package manager. And so we were just letting people commit packages essentially into the Julia repo. So the, the Julia yeah. repo ballooned for a while and got really huge and had all sorts of crazy stuff in it. It had like, you know, images, images plotting packages. It had a, a, an HTTP package it had like an editor in it it had uh it, it had a web-based c++ editor in it it had all sorts of bananas stuff and at some point i was looking at this and thinking like wow that's nuts uh we should probably have a real package manager so we stop committing code into, <laughs> into the main repo um so i made that but um i don't i don't regret that we did what we had to do at the time um i don't know yeah, I I tried to, I tried to actually re reading, uh, reading through some of the other questions, I actually did get a couple of ideas. So one of things I might, might have done differently. Uh, so for instance, possibly having closures capture variables by value instead of by binding. Yeah. Because yeah. although, you know, that definitely is a painful prospect to the, the schemer in me, but uh, it, it just seems like darn near a hundred percent of use cases want that yeah that does and it would, and it would help the performance situation a lot yes that would that would fix that performance situation pretty much so i i, I might have done that differently um the other one i thought of is having a non-interpolating quote non oh yes so, so not it, our quote is actually a quasi quote you're talking yeah about our quote is always quasi quote which i've you know i figured i'll oh, keep it simple you know quasi quote is a good is good enough but uh it, it gets you into a bunch of annoying corners when you get into really complicated nested you know nested macros and cases like that so i there should, we, should, we should have some sort of non-interpolating quote what uh so that that was a mistake i think why can't you just quote and not interpolate Hmm? Why can't you just quote it? Like, why can't you just use the quasi quote, quote construct without interpolating? Oh, you can, yeah. But if you, well, yeah, you you can, and that you know that's that's why you know I or or we or something were maybe seduced into thinking that this was sufficient, but it but it's not because uh, it's, it, as soon as you have some nested quote situation, as soon as you put a dollar sign in there, now you have interpolation. Oh, so that's that's the point. The, the issue is just that when you're trying to write something that involves quoted code, but you don't want to interpolate, it's annoying to write that. Yeah. Now you now you have to per, you know suppress interpolation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a pretty the uh, the capture by value thing. I can get behind the quote the quote thing feels very lispy to me. Like yeah, that it, that's in the weeds for sure. Yeah. That's that's very detailed. Um, I kind of regret our multi-line comment syntax. Uh, huh. I, I'm not sure whether I regret that we have it at all, or if I regret that I didn't take your suggestion. I think your suggestion was something like, uh, you know, uh, pound sign, open brace, and then something. I don't know. I bear, I don't really, I don't know if I remember that. <laughs> Yeah, you 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 suggested something like that, and I thought it was ugly, and I thought like the 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 pound sign equals was somehow like looked nicer. I don't know what I was thinking at the time, and then I kind of think it's a weird it's a weird choice now. Yeah, and, I do I do think it's a little weird, but I've definitely completely gotten used to it. I don't notice it anymore. Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, what else? I think the the other one I thought of is the array syntax and having more general ND array syntax. Oh yeah, I the space space significant syntax in arrays is such a pain. Yeah, um, it just is no end of like weird corner cases. Uh, it's gotten better because I feel like there were bugs and then people have just filed the bugs and there is it does tail off after a while. And now you basically just have to occasionally field an issue where someone says, you know, if in inside an array, I write one, you know, one plus two with some, you know, with normal spacing and it does what I want. And then I write one plus two with weird spacing and it doesn't do the same thing. And you're like, well, yeah, I think we should, we, and we could possibly do this now, even as we, we should have, or, or should uh, disallow binary operators with asymmetric space. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually, that's a Which pretty simple rule as well. Yeah, which that that we, we probably should have done that, and that that would help a little. But yeah, Although, the, the fact 
but the fact that there's certain kinds of arrays that are not easy to just write is uh, is, is annoying yeah 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 and it's un it's unclear that like block array syntax is important enough to like be worth all that pain right exactly yeah it's like it's a nice feature when you're trying to write you're trying to compose a matrix out of sub matrices but like you know did we need to inflict that on everybody like that's a that's a pretty niche niche corner case um yeah, i'm trying to think of other things uh i regret making printf a macro uh that was I, the story behind that is that there was this PyPy blog post where they were talking about how they got a huge speed up by specializing uh, their printing, their in, their number printing on, I think it was specifically printing integers, but it could have been floating point, whatever. Um, yeah, specializing on the format string generally. Yeah, they were, they were yeah. talking about specializing on the format string. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's a really cool idea. We could do that. That makes sense to do with macros. Like, if you're going to generate specialized code uh, for the format string, the natural thing to do is to make it a macro. Um, so I spent a month or so writing this insane printf macro code. And it was only at the end when I'd implemented everything when I discovered, like, hey, what the hell? This is, like, not actually faster why are they twice as fast as c and then i figured out that it was actually it was not that they were specializing on the format string their compiler was specializing on the fact that they were printing the same number twice and avoided formatting it twice so if you, yep. if, you if instead of printing the same integer two times you printed that integer and the integer plus one then you were at c speed so it was just like a false premise in the blog post that caused me to like go down this whole rabbit hole yeah, that was that was very sneaky. Uh, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't know if they did it on purpose. I doubt it. But like, it was very misleading, and and then then I, I just never got around to rewriting that. And I think it needs design work. Uh, Jacob has rewritten a lot of the uh, printf formatting stuff, and I promised him sometime last year that I'd review it, and I have failed to do so because I've been busy. There's always a rush to try to get package features into the next release. So, um, yeah, let's see. Um, what is a package that could exist and you wish wish existed, but no one has written yet? That's a really good question. Um, well, so this this is something that I think almost exists. So, so one thing I always wanted was the uh, SCM utils library from uh, Jerry Sussman's structure and interpretation of classical mechanics course mm -hmm. uh, to be redone in Julia. And people, at least one person has actually started on that. Uh, so people have kind of done that, but I don't know if it's finished. I haven't checked in on it recently, uh, but I would like to see a, a really good version of that. Um, I think I would love to see a native regex compiler in Julia. Mm. Um, I feel like that that's like one of those projects that uh you know is ever is like rapidly approaching the bottom of my list of to-dos because at no point in time is that like the most important thing for me to do, but I have always thought it would be a really cool project. Um I wonder if Kenta Sato has done it. I know he's done a lot of that type of work. Yeah, I think the the biosequences stuff might have something close to that. Yeah. Yeah. But a like general regex compiler seems like it would make sense. Um, and and I, I've, I've started to think about this and it's not really a, I've never quite figured out exactly how it should work, but I, I, I know I've told you about the idea that um, the way you should express string operations is that you should write a, sort of a, a finite state machine on code points and then translate that finite state machine into a finite state machine on bytes. So the, the, mm. tricky, the tricky part there is to express that generically enough. And the reason you want to express it in terms of code points and then translate it into bytes is because then you get in efficient implementations for all encodings for free. Right. The problem with writing code that operates on code points is you have to do this inefficient, like, oh, translate my UTF-8 into a code point and then operate on the code point and then emit UTF-8 again. It's yeah. like, oh, what I really want is a thing that, like, 
does the like very minimum amount of work by looking at a bite and deciding what to do next. Yeah. Sort of, you know, the, all the encoding and decoding just sort of gets turned into years in the machine. Um, that, I think that would be like, Saying there's a package called Automa, I can tell. It does. What's it called? The Automa. Automata, yeah. I think uh, that is one of uh, Kenta Sato's packages. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe I should look at that and we should uh, think about, you know, it, 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 would be, it would be interesting to look at, you know, replacing Julia's regex facility with something that's pure Julia. But on the other hand, PCRE has been great. Like the fact that you can just use PCRE and you get this like, completely standard way of doing regular expressions that just works is pretty awesome. So, uh, What's your favorite Julia package? Um, I, I always love to mention Unicode plots because I just think it's cool, but I, honestly, oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't plot stuff that much at all. So oh, Uni Unicode plots is a good one. Yeah. Unicode plots is awesome. Um, I, I think realistically, the package that I love, think is still think is just magical and use all the time is Revise. Mm. I always have Revise installed. I use it a lot. Um, the fact that it works so incredibly smoothly is like I know how it works and it still seems like magic. Like it's just one of those things where you're like, I, how does this work? Um, so if anybody doesn't use revise, you should. It is incredible. Yeah, that's that's a good one. I've I really like units. It's uh it's just it's really elegant and it's yeah, it's I think it's one of the only things out there that really lets you work with units in a program in a super practical way. And it's very cool. It's very fun to demo to people. Yeah, and the fact that it works so nicely with the type system to just, you know, you, sh you show this code that has like units all over it and, you know, and then it compiles down to just like a completely, you know, efficient operation, except that it catches if you make any sort of mistakes and it tells you what your units are in the end is pretty awesome. Yeah, and I, I also like colors a lot because I, I like these sort of interesting data types, you know, and the fact that a, an image can just be an array of color objects. Yeah, that is really, cool. really nice. Yeah, that was that was a great breakthrough in the images ecosystem, because we were sort of going down the traditional route of, you know, encoding, just using normal types, uint, eights, and whatever, and, you know, trying to encode the fact that like, oh, this dimension here is the is the color dimension and this is the red channel and this is all, all that stuff and it's like ah that that's it's just it's very fiddly and inelegant um and you sort of have to pass around all this knowledge about like what's the highest possible value what's the lowest possible value and then the breakthrough of just being like no no, no just like wrap the type you want to represent it in in a type that presents the behavior you want that was like a boom a moment I think that was like actually kind of a turning point in the Julia ecosystem as a whole, because I think it was one of the first aha moments where people really started to figure out how to use Julia's type system. Um, and I think that's been, that's been propagated elsewhere and a lot of people have, have, you know, done the same sorts of things, but that was when we really started to see a proliferation of like interesting little types that do some, something very well. Um, I think uh, related to that, there's a question uh, uh, slightly later, uh, which is, you know, about uh, packages as being omnibus packages with a lot of functionality or smaller packages that do one thing and have a one or a couple of types. So your thoughts around, you know, how does one structure code in the Julia ecosystem? Uh, so I think it is great to do small self-contained packages if the functionality is truly small and self-contained. Um, I think that especially in numerical computing, that is often not the case. And then people try to like factor things out a little prematurely. And it's much better to just like have a sort of big, big package with a bunch of related functionality and not try to 
tease it out too much because you're just going to end up making life difficult for yourself and your users. Um, I mean, my I, one of my you know own packages that I maintain that I, I like as an example of this is the tar package, so tar.jl. And the great thing about the tar.jl package is like it has a really really clear API, and that API is not changing. It knows how to it knows how to create, extract, and list tarballs. That is it. Like end of story. Um, because the API is so completely clear and it's not going to balloon from there. It's it's great that you can just like make it self-contained and test the heck out of it and then just be done. But uh, a lot of things just aren't like that. They're 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 too sprawling and too interconnected to to really easily tease out a little piece. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so from from a compiler perspective, I like to see small packages because you know, again, sometimes I, I see how much code is being pulled in to do certain amounts of work, and you know, and the and the sweat comes out, you know. But uh, <laughs> so, but at the same time, you know, that's that's right. That the the problem is everything is related to everything else. You know, like you might be able to say that some things are linear algebra functions and other things are statistics functions. But the fact of the matter is they're not separate subjects. It's not like they have nothing to do with each other. You know, they're, they are related. One's going to use the other. Uh, and everything is connected in, in this way. And so it's, it's difficult to get away from, you know, everything just sort of depending on everything else. Uh, and, and so in, in part, it's that we have this nice, you know, nicely integrated uh, ecosystem where everything kind of uses everything else because the, you know, reality is just like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to do when those balls of dependencies start getting really large. I'd... Yeah, I, I would say, in general, don't, you know, when you're developing something, don't over, don't over split it, you know, just build your thing, uh, get it working, don't try to make a lot of sub packages, because it's probably not worth it. Um, and you'll probably get the split wrong. Um, these, these divisions sometimes become clearer over time. Uh, if you have some like really clearly standalone piece of functionality, um, I think a lot of that has to do with if you're like, this is the API, this is a concept, this is the API for it, and then I'm going to test the, the hell out of that API. If you, if you can answer yes to all of those questions, if that's like really clear, then you have a standalone package. If that's not the case, then don't try to like split it out into its own package. Stefan, I know you've been, uh, you've spoken about it before, the idea of having multiple packages in the repo. Mm -hmm. That might be something that's related to this organization question as well. Oh yeah, I'd love something to see that. that. Yeah, so a lot of good work has been done on that recently. Um, uh, Gunnar Barnebeck and, uh, and I think so with some help from Christopher, uh, Carlson, so it's very much a Swedish endeavor. Um, they're they're working on uh, adding the ability to register packages that are located at a subdirectory of a repository. Um, there's nothing current. Yeah, it, it's it was a bunch of tooling needed to be done, but the fundamental the choice we made in the, the PKG three to associate package versions with subtrees means that you know any subdirectory is fine but uh, you know but then you need all the tooling to work so those they've been doing a hell of a job working on the tooling and making that possible so that should that should be possible soon yeah and I hope I hope that that will lead to packages being broken up a little bit more yeah without having to split up the repos yeah because that's that's the big thing is right it's it's it's, uh, it's you know it's annoying to work on lots of different repos so I, I don't even think that's the biggest issue. I mean, for example, I think, you know, in, in the package manager, I early on sort of made some sub modules because I thought it was the right thing to do. Um, and I feel like everyone who works on the package manager agrees now that it's like, it's just annoying. And there's no, re <laughs> no reason for these things to be sub modules. Um, mm -hmm. And the, where the code goes ends up being sort of like arbitrary. Like there's a types submodule and an operation submodule, and there's types in the operation submodule and operations in the type submodule. And it's like, why are they like this? I who knows? Like it just it just got out of control. Um, and I think that's a good example of like an artificial separation that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Like mm -hmm. 
um, you know, putting all the types in one place and all the operations on those types in another place is just a stupid way to split it up. I don't know what I was thinking, but I made that decision and we've been struggling with it ever since. Um, a more reasonable thing is, you know, I, now I'm sort of slicing off a piece of the, a package manager that is called content trees. And the idea is that it is a sort of platform independent way of dealing with content addressed trees of uh, immutable trees. And hmm. that's like, a, that's a clean concept. That's a concept that makes sense independent of the package manager. Other people might want to use it. I can test it by itself. Um, so that's why it makes sense. It doesn't make sense like, oh, let's silo all the types over here. That's just, that's just a dumb division. So, yeah. Um, Abek, how long are we going to go? I don't know what the plan is. So we, uh, we have been going for about an hour, 15 minutes at this point. So I think we should stop in about another 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. I'm sure let's do okay, more talk. questions. So we'll get a couple of more questions. We have over 80 questions submitted and many more on the chat. So unfortunately we will never be able to get to all of them. Is there an, anything, but, anything you, interesting you can pull out of the YouTube chat? Uh, so there was one recent question about Simulink. A lot of people are interested about in Simulink and whether we will have a Simulink like thing in Julia. Oh yeah, the whole, uh, the whole DiffEQ ecosystem is, is absolutely working on that. Yeah. I mean, we're not really the people to talk about it. I don't, we don't know much. About I don't know. Yeah, I don't know much about that. But you can, yeah, you you can find that though in the in the Julia modeling and Julia DiffEQ uh, organizations. Yeah, I, I I think my understanding is that the the goal, the high level goal, is to be able to model much much bigger things, like orders of magnitude bigger systems um, than has ever been done before which is, you know, an ambitious goal, but I absolutely believe that it's possible. Uh, the, com the combination of the, you know, Julia technology with the team that is working on that and people should get involved if they're interested in that sort of thing. It's not a closed, uh, it's not a closed effort by any means. Um, I think Chris Rakakis is probably the person to contact there. Um, yeah. Or Veral, you can always contact Veral about anything. Yeah. They'll put you in touch with the right people. Um, but yeah, that, that, I think that that's pretty exciting from what I heard. I know about it. Um, what motivates us to keep working on Julia? Well, I mean, it's our baby. Like, uh, <laughs> it's like, what's that's right. That's right. What, what, motiv what motivates parents to keep taking care of their children? I don't know. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, and it, and it is, it is still fun to work on and, uh, yeah, people are doing cool stuff with it. So it's not hard. Yeah, it's always amazing to see the stuff people do with Julia. It's like blows my mind every time. Um, you know, the Julia Khan talks every year are just incredible. I'm like, I didn't know about this and I'm, our, I'm amazed and I can't believe that you can do that. And also, you know, usually the stories people tell and it's often the same story, but it's in a different field. It's like, well, I was doing this with this other tool and just wasn't cutting it. And it was taking like, you know, months to compute this thing. And then I ported it to Julia and now it takes 30 seconds. And you're like, that's amazing. That's really, really incredible. Um, gives you a sense of accomplishment that, you know, people are doing such cool things with it, um, which is which is useful because sometimes the stuff we're working on is pretty damn mundane and boring. It's kind of a slog. So it is really motivating to see other people do the actual applications that are so cool. Um, Will Julia support ARM 32-bit Raspberry Pi in the future? Um, I am really not the person to ask about this. I, I don't know. You might actually be a better person to ask about this. Yeah, I think so. Julia does support uh, ARM 32-bit. Unfortunately, the support is not 100% right now. But uh, so the binaries get uh, published a little later from the official releases. But right now we have uh, the 1.4 binary on the ARM 32 bit that's been released. Took us a couple of weeks after the original 1.4 release, but it's there and- uh, Nice. Uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, so yeah, it is, the future is now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, 
Uh, you've talked about this a bit already, Jeff, but uh, how big a problem is increasing code complexity within the, Ju within the Julia code base? Uh, um, I, I'm not clear if this is about the Julia, Julia's own code base or the Julia ecosystem. Because you've yeah, talked good about compile times being you know, exacerbated by people writing more and more wild Julia code. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I would I would interpret this as being about like our, our code, like the compiler and standard libraries. I think, mm -hmm. uh, which are they're they're growing at a slow, steady pace, but really not very much. I uh, I think it's been pretty good. We don't really have an insane amount of code. I mean, yeah. for a, a language and compiler, the amount of uh, code in there is really not very much. So it's pretty manageable. I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, the, I think some of the worst uh, culprits are things like the package manager and linear algebra. They're sort of, they're at the leaves of the standard libraries. Um, and one of the things we want to do there is sort of prune the dependency graph. Um, you know, one of the things, this, it was unclear when doing the, the PKG3 whether we should include standard libraries as like explicit dependencies. And I'm really glad that we did. Um, one of the things that happened in that process was we saw how tangled the, inter the dependency graph within the standard libraries was because we had to explicitly write that down. And we were a little bit horrified about what we, what we discovered when we wrote that graph down. Um, and Christopher did a lot of good work on pruning that and basically getting rid of bogus dependencies where you know you had some like seemingly small simple standard library dependent on some very very complicated standard library and you're like that dependency should not be there uh, so we cut a lot of those um, I think the process there should be moving things out of the standard libraries or at least making them more independent because then it kind of doesn't matter like if the package manager wants to do all sorts of complicated things it can as long as it's not you know hooked back into the rest of the rest of the system then you know you could potentially not even load that code there's no no reason why julia needs to load the package manager on startup as long as we can load it pretty quickly when we need it yeah so in general i think it's not a big problem we always keep an eye on it but yeah Yeah, how do you attract more con more contributors to work on the compiler? Oh, that's that's a tough one. I mean, uh, you know, any chance we get, we try to encourage people to contribute to things. It's all, you know, it's all, it always makes sense to try to jump in and do something. But um, I'd also think that you know, a, a compiler does require certain specialized knowledge unavoidably. Uh, maybe not necessarily all of it, but unavoidably, there is you know quite quite a bit of uh, specialized knowledge there. I mean, actually even talking to people at like Microsoft or Google, they will bemoan uh, the difficulty of hiring compiler people, for, mm -hmm. for instance. So indeed, that's a tall order. Yeah, it, from compiler people are a, a special breed. I feel like, you know, you either, it's, it's more of willingness than anything else. I feel like, you know, anyone could learn the stuff, but like, are you willing to do all the stuff that is involved in being a compiler person? Um, I, I personally have not been. I mean, I guess I could probably. I know a little bit more about compilers than most people. Uh, it's probably a slight understatement, but, you know, I don't work on the compiler. And, you know, occasionally you, you encounter one of these people in the wild, like, you know, Jameson is now this incredible compiler engineer, but, you know, he was a physicist. Somehow he got seduced. Uh, you know, Tim Holy works on, you know, uh, you know, image image stuff and uh, and you know and MR scans, but like, you know, somehow he's gotten suckered into doing compiler work. So, but some people just discover like, oh, this compiler thing is really fun. Yeah, I mean, the the thing about compilers is it's kind of paradoxically, compilers are actually easy. It's just a simple function. You know, you input a program, you output a different program. It's, it's a pure function. It's actually very simple. But because it's so simple and useful, it's kind of one of the oldest and most studied problems in computer science. So there's just a huge amount that's known about it. And that's, that's kind of become the problem, is that there's just 
so so much built up stuff about it because it's kind of it's it's something that you can attack there there are lots of things you can do about it uh so people have and there's just lots and lots of built up knowledge so you know if you dig through looking through something like lvm it's just incredible how many algorithms are known how many different kinds of optimizations are known it's just it's just a lot of stuff i guess to address the actual question which is how do we how do we get more compiler people um so far, people have just showed up. Um, we have attempted to, you know, hire compiler engineers, and that has not gone well. Uh, we've not hired anyone through, you know, like job postings for compiler people. Um, on the open source side, you know, it's not like you can recruit open source contributors anyway. They they show up and they do stuff, um, and that's kind of been the only way that's happened. Uh, I, I do wonder if we could make the, comp I mean, the dev docs are actually pretty good these days and that helps a lot getting people into the compiler stuff. Um, Julia's compiler is actually really cool and interesting and not that intimidating compared to other compilers. Um, so I do wonder if it could be, you know, sort of uh, a good teaching platform for understanding compiler technology and that would help get people involved. Um, but I think that would involve a lot of work. Yeah, like Yan Vitek, for instance, has done a bunch of stuff on the academic side to uh, get people working on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that has, uh, that, that's, that's brought in a couple contributions. Yeah. So maybe the last couple of questions mm -hmm. before we have to end. Okay. The next uh, one is about cassette. What do you guys think about cassette and its approach? What do you think about feasible? Yeah, what I, do you think about the future of projects like cassette? Yeah. I, I think it, I think it's very cool. I, I uh, yeah, I, I think it, sh it would be nice if it worked. I mean, there, there's been this long, uh, long running thread on the interval arithmetic package, for example, that I've been chiming in on every now and then about how to change the rounding modes. And mm -hmm. there's just people are throwing every solution you can possibly imagine and absolutely none of them work because it's just, it's like, no, you have to have max performance everywhere. Uh, and it's not specific to the types of numbers. Uh, and it's, it has to be like sort of dynamic context dependent. So cassette is sort of like the solution. It's kind of the only thing you can do. Mm. Um, so it, it seems to have some really, you know, interesting use cases. I, I do think it's this nice, uh, kind of way to extend a programming language that fits surprisingly naturally with Julia and it's a really, you know, unique capability. Uh, so I, I think it's cool and I, I would like to see it uh, keep working. Do you think there is more stuff that needs to be done there? I kind of got the impression that initially it was a bit of a hack, which then got a little more support. Like how, yep. how far on the hack versus officially supported spectrum is it at this point? Yeah, I, I, my guess is it's somewhere in the middle still. Yeah. Uh, there has been a bunch done to make it more first class. I'm not super up on the latest state of it. I, I'm not totally sure, but I think it's still somewhere in the in the middle. But it's it's pretty good though, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if we had no obligations and could work on any Julia thing we wanted to, what would we do? That's a that's a good question. I I like that one. <laughs> there's there's a there's a lot of stuff yeah i don't know um so i mean the, the latency thing does bother me as much as everyone else so i actually do think i would be working on that um i i also feel like the package manager needs to be done ri really right i mean we've seen what happens in programming languages that where no one on the core language team cares about package management and you know you get the python problems uh, so I, I would probably work on that. Um, I would, I, I, the more I think about it, I would like to do this thing of re redesigning the, the front end and rewriting it in Julia, especially because the macro system really needs kind of a redesign, uh, which I, so I, that's something I would like to do, but it's, it just doesn't feel like a super high priority. I mean, people file bugs about macros, but I don't feel like everyone out there is like clamoring for a better designed macro system. It just doesn't seem super, super important. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, but I would like to do that because I think there's, there's a, that's, that's a kind of an ugly area of the language. I would at some point like to, and I've, I have 
an, a design and I just haven't had time to implement it, but uh, improve the version resolver for the package manager. Cause it's this, uh, it's this, it, it actually works great for, you know, most of the time, but it's very bad at, you know, occasionally the, the version resolver gets confused and it's very bad at telling you what went wrong when you, you know, have a problem. So I would love to rework that and I have an idea, but haven't had the time. Okay, uh, uh, probably the last question. Do we regret naming the language Julia? No. No. Uh, a, yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice a name. Answer. It is, no doubt. Um, okay, one last question which got voted up. Um, what are the compiler priorities after time to first plot? Uh, I, th I think we covered some of that. I mean, uh, yeah. there's more work on, on threads. And there's the tree shaking, you know, making, shaking, making yeah. small self-contained binaries. Um, what, what about, I, I think this would be really cool. Do you have any thoughts on a static subset of the language or like a statically analyzable subset of the language? Because it's never going to have static semantics. Yeah, no, I, I that that's another one of those top requested features where people want to, uh, you know, ha impose some very strict checks on some part of code or a function or something that you like. I, you know, I want this to be fully type inferred and do no allocations and et cetera, whatever it is. And uh, yeah, I think I think we could have that. I mean, especially like the uh, if you just take the monomorphic subset of Julia, then it's just. You, you can have a very straightforward, you know, statically typed language, essentially. Uh, it's not a fancy static type system. Uh, it would just be a simple one, but can, that might you, cover a lot of explain, cases. Can you explain what you mean by monomorphic? Yeah, I mean, just basically a, 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 some piece of code, a function or a set of functions just has to be, uh, everything has to be statically known about them. So there's no runtime polymorphism left. So you just basically know the concrete type of everything and we know everything that's happening in that code. And that's that's a static type system. And uh, it's not, a, like I said, not a fancy static type system. It's not gonna win any best paper awards, but it covers, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of cases where like everything is a float 64, for example. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of economically important code where everything is just, uh, you know, a float 32 or something. So just check that everything is a float 32 is a, very simple and unimpressive, but very valuable type system. So, <laughs> great. Uh, thanks, Stefan and Jeff, for your time. It's been amazing. Yeah, I've had fun. a lot of fun. Um, I'm sure most of our viewers have had as, as well. Yeah. If you are new to Julia, I know some of you are on on the stream. Please join us on Slack or Discourse. Uh, we are a reasonably friendly community, even if I say so myself. Uh, and we would love to have uh, have you learn more about Julia. So please find us on uh, Slack and our discourse. And thanks for joining. We will hopefully keep doing more of these in the weeks to come. Um, we've had people join from all over the world. So thanks once again. Thanks, Jeff and Stefan. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank thanks you. for your questions. Bye. There was There was a bunch of good ones. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Bye.